Being healthy isn't just about exercising and eating right. In fact, on studies done on healthy people, there's specific habits, specific practices that they tend to have in common. That's what we're going to talk about in today's episode. Seven habits of truly healthy people. I like this because everybody's like, workout, diet, but there's way more to health than just those yeah, two things. Yeah, and these ones you'll find actually move the needle even further. Yes. Uh, and I, the studies are now out there to prove it, which is uh, quite interesting. I like this conversation. It's We we started it, I guess, a, a couple of days ago in a qual. We were kind of alluding to this, right? Like, uh, like how much time we spend in the gym. And I made the point that like, you know, I'm in a place in my life right now where um, I'm trying to spend as little time in the gym as possible to give me the greatest return so that I can allocate the rest of my time and resources to probably the all these other things that we're talking about. I don't think that, I don't think I really understood that when I was younger I don't, or I was so blinded by my insecurities or chasing vanity so much that totally. I didn't care where I think it, just where I'm at in my life now, I think I, I pay more attention to these habits and I consider this all part of my health yeah, journey. Yeah, these are the most overlooked, like hands down. They're not the most promoted, you know, the the vanity stuff and uh, I mean, even strength on some level for like I'm PRing or I'm, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, effort in that direction, but really nobody's talking about these behavioral changes. Yeah, I mean, of course, to be clear, you know, proper exercise and diet have significant impacts um, on your health, but the way that marketing and media portray looking a particular way, you would think that that was all health was, right? That if I were to say to someone, you know, what would a healthy person look like? And they would probably pick out somebody that would be like a fitness influencer or back when we were younger, someone you would see on the cover of a magazine. But what's interesting is when you meet people in person, there's way there's so many other things that display health or poor health that don't have anything to do with your body fat percentage or your muscularity. Um, and, and, and look, we we know this all too well in our space, right? In the professional health and fitness space, there are just as many unhealthy people in our space as there are in the you know the the other spaces. In other words, the fitness and health space, which is supposed to be the space that's all about being healthy. There's just as many unhealthy people in our space as there is outside of it. Now they may look different because they obsess over their bodies, but there's other things that have that have massive impacts on your overall health. And humans are not just our bodies, right? We have a mind. Many people argue we have a spirit. Uh, we're also have relationships with people around us. And in the data, by the way, this isn't just a speculating or you know saying, hey, this is uh, this is a good idea. The data on all this is extremely clear. There's that one study that I, I brought up many times, and there's many others that we'll talk about today that com that talked about how having poor relationships was as bad as smoking 10 cigarettes a day. Yeah. You know, so regardless of how you exercise and, and your diet, if you have bad relationships, then it, you might as well be smoking 10 cigarettes a day. And that, when I read that study years ago, it made me think of all the people that I worked with in gyms, and even myself to an extent, um, especially in the early days of training, how much I sacrificed relationships with people in the pursuit of looking a particular way, um, and then lying to myself and saying this is healthy, when in fact uh, it's not. Now, the, the the title of this episode, right, we're doing the seven habits of truly healthy people, and I think the idea was to talk about things that are uh, less obvious, right, yeah. than what we normally would communicate yeah. right of course we'd include fitness and right macros and, and lifting weights uh is does not make this list and so it's the other things but I, you you bring up the point about like you know chasing the aesthetics or trying to look a certain way and stuff do you believe though even though the macro portion and the lifting weights portion is not on here and that's all a, a big component of obviously looking good do you think that somebody could follow these seven you know, traits or habits and obtain a, a very healthy physique or a, a very balanced, say, body? Or do you think that these habits lead to you wanting to do Correct. that? That's it. You think that's that's, what I, that's 100%. As we go through these, what you'll find um, is, as you're listening, is that if you actually paid attention to these and made them priorities or really understood that these uh, had, you know, impacts on your health, 
and you pursued them that your desire mm -hmm. to be active, your desire to nourish yourself with food, your desire to care for yourself would uh, improve and go up, which means you're more likely well, to exercise. You'd be in a higher right. energetic state. You'd yeah. be in a better, clear frame of mind. And so, you know, for you to pursue more things that you can grow from, I think that would just be a natural fit. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to uh, picture somebody that I know that uh, you know exemplifies all these habits like really well, and like trying to picture. Do they look really fit too? Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't and, know if they'll look like a bodybuilder or like some shredded. Not initially, yeah. But they'll, but they probably. Look healthy. Yeah. 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 Exactly. In yeah. fact, the bodybuilder we could argue is extreme, right? And yeah. not, uh, you know, super <clears throat> healthy. I mean, health is is so many different things. Um, generally, you know, you could put them in a category of like mental health. Then there's physical health. There's your relational health, and then your spiritual health. And all of those have been pretty well established. To have to to be quite important, but here's what's interesting: if you ignore one of them, or if one of them goes south, all the others are affected. So, uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably well aware of physical health, okay? And we're you know we're we're fitness experts, so that's our wheelhouse. If your physical health, I'll use that as an example, is terrible because of your lifestyle, if you have really really bad physical health, your mental health is very likely to be affected negatively. We know that for a fact. Your relational health, the health that you have with the people around you, is also very likely to be negatively impacted. And then your spiritual health could also or is likely to also be negatively impacted because of your terrible physical health. And I could say this for all of the other ones. So to try to parse them out and say this is health, this is health, it's not, that's not uh, the, the story. It would be like taking an ingredient out of a cake and then saying, is it still a cake? It's not. Once you take the eggs out of the milk out, it becomes, it's not a cake anymore. It's something else. So all of these are important. Um, but we, but media and advertising makes us believe that looking a particular way, well, that's what health is. And then the other stuff, you know, maybe not so much. And so we don't tend to value it. We don't tend to pay attention. Today's episode is brought to you by Haya Health, multivitamins for children that are not Candy. This has the nutrients your kids need. No sugar. Great stuff. Go check them out. Go to HayaHealth.com. That's H-I-Y-A Health.com forward slash Mind Pump. And on that link, you'll get 50% off your first order. Also, today's program giveaway is MAPS Powerlift. Enter to win by leaving a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, this month's sale, MAPS Anabolic and MAPS Anabolic Advanced both 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. So what's what's number one on your list? Number one is to disconnect from all media and to make this a somewhat regular practice. What's interesting about this, and this has just gotten worse and worse, mm -hmm. is media is, the, the people that design apps and social media platforms and your phone. I mean, in a very short period of time, <clears throat> your phone has become such an, such a part of who you are that leaving the house with it induces anxiety in a lot of people. I mean, we grew up without them. Mm -hmm. We drove places without, you know, uh, your phone. We looked things up without a phone or we talked about things without a phone. Now it's, it's become such a, in, in, in such an important part of our life or such an integral part of our life that it induces, literally induces anxiety when people think, oh my gosh, I forgot my phone, my phone's broken or, or I lost my phone. Um, you are inundated with um, information and apps and entertainment that is consistently and continuously engineered to be so irresistible that um, it has drug-like effects uh, on your brain, your body, and it's so hard to resist that in fact, me saying this, just people right now, people hearing me say, disconnect from all media. Think to yourself, could I turn everything off, TV and phone, for a full day, and what would that feel like? And I think a lot of people listening would think, whoa, that'll be a challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to schedule stuff. Like, what's that going to be like? Because it's so it's 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 so distracting. It's so, uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a practice like you – we learned growing up when we didn't have something readily accessible to entertain you uh, 24 seven. And it's like, uh, I would just had this conversation with my kids and, and just what that does is it really helps you to form ideas better. It helps you to kind of think about 
things a little differently, which you know promotes innovation, or you, maybe you're you're just tripping on uh, a certain subject at school and you just can't get it, and you know maybe you're allowing your brain that enough time to really kind of form these these ideas together, and we just don't take the time to not be inundated with input. And it's just, it, I guarantee it, it'll unlock something for you that you wouldn't have even thought of before. I think that's probably the most important takeaway from disconnecting from media is, yes, I agree. It induces stress and anxiety and it's, uh, it's created to get a reaction out of you. It's created to be addictive, which is all, are all negative things. But even more so, uh, the positive, the healthy side of it is what it unlocks as far as what you can do with that time now. That's right. So instead of being anxious and angry and frustrated because- Or just of, distracted. Be productive yeah. or, yeah. Right. Now now I have this this free time to go put that, whether that be with my family or friends or learning or growing or uh, improving. Um, it just- that is so, uh, th I think that's the most important piece of just disconnecting from it, aside from what it's doing from the toxic even, side. Even just sitting quietly. You know, when they do studies on modern hunter-gatherers, what they find is that they do have downtime. It's not like they're hunting and gathering all day long. They do have downtime. And it looks like either with each other or quiet, yeah. where they're sitting and there's nothing going on and they're just observing. When's the last time you stood in a line and you just stood there yeah. without reading or being distracted. Not long ago, and it was hard. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for coffee for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I was dying. Like, yes. Because I left my phone in the car. Yes. Yeah. Or how many conversations have not happened? How many connections have not happened right. because uh, of the distractions uh, of media? So it's it, more than anything, it gets in the way. And the only way to know this is to turn it off. And then the obvious, right? The obvious is, um, you know, I, it, I can find alarming news or information at any time. In fact, I don't have to look for it. If I open my phone and go to an app, it's what's going to pop up. And that's designed to elicit a response in you. And 99.99% .99 of the information that's alarming you are things that you can do nothing about. So it's not like, hey, your kid is hurt. Uh oh, got to go get my kid. It's about something else somewhere. I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's in fact, that's one of the worst things you can do to kids. By the way, this is bad for adults too, but especially for children, is to present them with a problem that they have no control of, control or or, or understanding of. It's a it's a terribly indu uh, anxiety inducing thing. In, fa yeah. in fact, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, when people are stressed out and anxious. They used to tell people, now they say turn off social media, but they used to say turn off the news. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most common things that they would tell people. So this should be a, a practice. Um, I, I'll never forget, uh, you know, I've told this story before, but it was such a, boy, did it hit me, man. I was with my kid. And at the time, I want to say he was maybe a year and a half old. And he was playing by himself quietly. And I was sitting on the couch while he was playing. And I decided to not look at my phone. What I had done before that was when he was playing, I'm like, oh, this is time for me to go on my phone, social media, work, check email, whatever. But I remember at this point, I put my phone down aside and said, I'm not gonna do that. And I noticed that every so often, he would look up to see if I was watching him. And I had not noticed that while I was on my phone. So how many times had my kid looked yeah. up and saw dad, and dad's not even here. Just head down. Head yep. down on his phone while I'm over here playing. So the impact is, far reaching. So this can become a practice. And so you see this with uh, healthy people, they will have this as a structured practice. Well, they'll say things like, I don't turn on my social media until this time of the day, or I turn it off at this time of the day, or I have one day a week mm -hmm. where I totally unplug or when I get home scheduled I, hours for it. Yes. Or when I get home, I put my phone over here and then I only check it twice during the day or something like that. It's also one of those things that I've never met anybody who has decided to create some sort of boundaries or breaks with it and have not all seen positive effects from it. I've never met somebody who's yeah, like, yeah, I hey, I decided to not open social media till noon every day, right? Not start my day with it and it not improve. Like it's one of those simple things that you can start to build into your life that you see immediate return. Yeah. hundred percent. I've not had a client or a person that I've shared this with that has then gone and done it and then reported back like, yeah, I didn't notice any improvement. I didn't like everybody sees significant improvement in their well being, their attitude, their health, their, their productivity. Like it's it, totally. across the board. And then for parents, uh, you know, I remember I would get parents that would come in 
that would talk to me about their child's, uh, you know, issues with diet or inactivity, you know, Hey, my kid's overweight, what can I do? And the parent themselves would have poor eating habits and wouldn't be active. And it's like the best thing you can do, the biggest impact you'll have on your kids is if you improve your fitness and your diet. So why am I saying this? I just read a, a, a study. The average teenage kid is on social media or apps four to six hours every day. Mm -hmm. So if you're a parent and you disconnect, here's what happens to me when I do it. I'm far more aware of just how much my teenagers are on it. And I'm far more likely to create boundaries and then have us all turn them off and be together. Yeah. So the impact is pretty far reaching. Yeah. Next up, this is a big one that is starting to, we're starting to see uh, a negative slide on this. Um, this used to be a staple in every family, which is to eat dinner with your family. Like have one meal where you all sit down together yeah. and connect. Undivided attention. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, if you're, if you're a, a parent and especially when your kids are a little older, when they're little, it's different, but when they're a little older and they can do their own things, if we don't have dinner together, I could very easily go not like, seeing them, not seeing my kids or in passing, but this is like a seated every day at this time, we all sit down mm -hmm. and we talk and we connect and we meet with each other. It's a big deal. I think you're also more likely, again, I'm trying to think of how these things lead into just being, you know, physically healthier too. It's like if you're sitting down and making dinner or having dinner together, you're more likely to be making better choices too yes. versus everyone's door dashing their favorite thing or drive through or snacking on junk or, or like eating that. in front of the TV. Well, yeah, and you right. see their habits right in front of you in terms of like what they are drawn to, like food wise, like portions, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then obviously the check ins from their day is like, well, it's massively important. Like you stay into their lives. If they feel like you're not in their lives, this is where the big disconnect and a lot of problems come from. This, there's so many fun conversations or challenging topics or insight that you get when you all sit down together. Cause there's a dynamic that you have with your spouse or your friends with your kids. And then there's a family dynamic and you feel that when you practice on a regular basis, dinner, how are we all together? How are my older kids with my younger kids? How's my wife with the kids? How are we all together? And uh, the insight you get on it is incredible, but it's also just daily connection. Because again, like uh, if you don't do this, especially if you have kids that are a little older, you could very easily go days without all of you sitting down together. At the yeah, same time. I, I think of this in very similar to how you, any therapist will recommend this for a marriage that has has not created this space for themselves. Right, a lot of times what happens, you have kids. And it's kind of divide and conquer. And then you stop making time for your, your wife or your spouse, right? And so scheduling a date night every week yeah. is like one of the one of the best ways to keep a healthy marriage, right? And it's just to, because you have that scheduled time that you're going to connect. You might get busy all week and not really get a chance to just pass each other. But at least you know that dinner night, you're going to have that. I feel like this is the same thing, but for your kids, to your point, like once they get to a certain age, they really are. They're like sports and they got school and they got yes. their friends and got their things. And so really easily they could, you know, pass you by in the night. Whereas if you know that, Hey, we have a dinner time that we all sit down at the bare minimum, I'm going to get that, you know, 30 minutes to an hour with my kids where we're going to be able to connect and talk. And, and I mean, I can speak directly to this. This is the best time that I have, um, with my family. We, we all sit down, we'll all eat together. And it doesn't matter if someone's in a bad mood, whatever. We all sit there, we all eat. And then we make jokes or we see the, you know, the baby do something. We talk, whatever. Then we clean up together and typically we'll play music or we'll have conversation that would never have happened had we not all sat down at a de designated time to eat mm -hmm. and you learn things and you hear things and you talk about things. And it's just, uh, it's like, Hey, this is what we do. And it's, uh, it's amazing. And the data on this is pretty dismal more and more family. I don't remember what the number is, but it's a pretty significant percentage of people don't have a single meal together as a family, oh. which is, uh, wow. yeah, really interesting. Right. Oh. All right, next up, this one is, I think, a big deal. This has always been something that's been important. I think it got stigmatized for a while once it became a profession. But I do think that this, you don't necessarily need to do this in any specific way, but I think seeking a coach uh, or therapy or a mentor, I think, is incredibly important because, uh, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've experienced this. I know you guys, I'm sure, mm -hmm. have the same when you have someone from the outside looking in, 
there are things you just simply don't know that you don't know. And that's when this becomes incredibly yeah, you're valuable. You're unaware of it. There are things I know that I don't know, and there's some value there too, but there are things where I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that I didn't know that. And somebody on the outside, uh, you know, really did. plus it's also a de designated time where you're saying, I am going to try and grow as a person. Mm -hmm. That's the goal here. So I'm hiring or working with this individual to try to grow, to try to become a better person. And the simple fact that you're, you're dedicating time to do that means you're better off than 90% of the people out there that don't. It does feel like it's less stigmatized though, don't you think? Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like that is. And I, and I, think, and, I and I do think the biggest takeaway from this is, again, this is uh, forced growth. You know, uh, if you're really good about doing this on your own, that's great. But having a coach, having a therapist, having a mentor, uh, you know, make ensures that to happen, right? Because mm -hmm. you're going to have somebody who's, to your point, you know, uh, challenging from the outside looking in saying, calling you out on your bullshit, which then in turn hopefully forces growth. And so I think that's the most important piece of that is less about, oh, I had to go see this formal doctor and I'm in mm -hmm. therapy or I had, to, it's like, well, what it that's is. That's one way to do it. Yeah, that's exactly. That's a way to do it's like it. It's a non-biased uh, uh, observation. Yeah. Of, what, it, what, it, what it really is, is I'm, I'm committed to growing. Yeah. That's what it is. It's like, I'm, I'm pursuing growth. I'm open-minded enough to hear somebody else out and their perspective of what's going on in my life. And I'm, I'm here to get better. And I think that is so important to being healthy. Like it, we have to constantly be evolving and getting better and improving ourselves. This is a organized yeah. way. And of a lot that. of times, and I, I was like this a long time ago where I thought, Oh, well that's if you're, if you got a problem, you know, if you got a big issue, then you go work with somebody or you seek out coaching or, or therapy, but no, yeah, that's obviously a reason why you would work with someone. <laughs> But it's also like this, like, do you think you're your perfect self? Do you, do you, have you reached the zenith of what you think you could accomplish? If the answer is no, which it should be, because I don't think that's ever going to stop. Be, but yeah. Then this is a hack is all it is. It's a hack. Even talking things out with a person who's listening, oftentimes as you process things by simply talking them out, you tend to hear uh, your own words come out of your mouth. Like, uh, like there are ways that I grew up and things that I did as a kid that I didn't even think were that odd. Everybody's or, flawed. Everybody, hundred <laughs> percent. So this makes a huge, uh, huge difference in growth. And what's funny about this is when you look at the percentage of people that would be in a category considered highly successful monetarily, family, you know, no jail record, that whole deal. Well, you'll notice a good percentage of them. Work with coaches. Yeah. A good percentage of them work with people that help them, you know, do this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. The next one is, uh, I, you know, it's, it's funny that we have to say this, but it's to spend a lot of time outside and outdoors. What's funny to me as a father is watching my kids because you're, you know, you, you notice things in your kids and then you can say, oh, that's me too. That's got to be me too, right? When my kids are outside most of the day, they're calmer. Yeah. They're more present. They're more talkative. They're more intuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, they go to bed and go to sleep right. really nice. Um, it's just they're it, it, they're better humans. And I don't mean that, that before they were bad humans, but it's like, it's almost like this. Mm. This is the funny thing. It's almost like pent we up energy. To, it's almost like we were meant to be out yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like we're supposed to be outside. I don't know. It's strange. <laughs> well, it's interesting to me because people, uh, you know, we take this for granted. If you had a dog and you're like, oh my God, you go to the vet and you're like, my dog just chews up my furniture and eats all my yeah. food, all my shoes and poops everywhere. First thing the, the vet would ask you is, how often do you take your dog out for a walk? Yeah. Oh, never. Dog's inside all day long. Oh, well, that's the problem. Yeah. Somehow humans. We don't. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. My kid's doing this or I'm feeling like this or I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling depressed or I'm like, whatever. Yeah. Nobody's like, hey, They're are you going short outside? with you? Yeah. yeah. Like, are you going outside? Like what's going on? I mean, this, this one's been on my mind quite a bit. I mean, we just, uh, before we sat down and record this podcast, we got outside to go for a walk in the what sun. What a difference. And it makes such a big difference. And I still don't think I do it enough. We just got back from being down in Mexico and it's like, man, uh, it's just not that often where I have a day where pretty much from sun up to sundown, I'm outside in sun and water. And there's just something about the way I sleep, the mood that I'm in, like from that, it's like, man, I have to, I, this is, so this is heavy on me right now. Of like, even though I, I feel, I feel like I make a practice to get out more, I don't think I do it nearly enough of what I should do for optimal health. I think this is an area where 
especially people that live in the city like we do, like if you live in a city, this is probably an area where you could significantly improve your health by making this a, a daily practice. Well, for, from okay, again, look at it from an evolutionary standpoint. For most of human history, what did it mean if you were inside the cave 90% of the time? Yeah. Why were you in the cave 90% of the time? You were sick or injured. So you, were, you were probably terribly sick or or very injured, but probably not even injured. They'd probably put you outside and hang out with everybody. But if yeah. you're like really sick, like you stay in there yeah. away from someone, or you've been shunned, yeah. or you've been kicked out of society. And that signal, which your, which your body is sending within, says, we are sick, therefore we need to feel this particular way, which is typically depressed, anxious, low energy. You talked about, we just went outside. We record this podcast in an enclosed studio for production purposes, and I can feel, I feel physically the difference when we're in here without going outside. And we did, what do we do? A 10 minute walk? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a massive difference. And that's not even, well, the funny thing is a 10 minute walk is way less <laughs> than- Yeah, that's what, what I mean. Like I, I could feel, a, just last week, like I said, we were just in Mexico and like, I haven't got that kind of a like outdoor, uh, you know, sun exposure and water and stuff like that. And it just, the, the feeling is like, it compares nothing to how I felt the whole whole mm -hmm. month prior. It's like, dude, man, it's so important to do that uh, totally more. Next up, uh, volunteer your time. You know, they show the 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 payback um, that this gives people in terms of uh, perspective, meaning. Mm -hmm. I remember when my kid had to volunteer. Um, uh, he was had to he was packing food and uh, giving it to the homeless, and I remember his attitude was very different uh, when he came home that day. Because he gave him a completely different perspective. And he felt, you could tell he felt good about the fact that he yeah. did something for other people. Brings a lot of gratitude, you know, for yes. your own situation. And it, it gets you outside of yourself because a lot of times we just get concerned every day with like everything involving just you and how I got to do this and this is this. Instead of the, now really focusing on somebody else, it, it's it's liberating in a sense. Yeah. it's It's really easy to... Look at your problems that you have, um, and and think they're the biggest ever because they are the biggest ever. They're the biggest ever because they're your biggest problems that you've ever. And to be able to see that there are always people out there that have hard had it harder than you, that are less fortunate than you are, um, really brings in uh, perspective. This was so important to my journey because I had a lot of resentment and animosity towards my parents because of the how I grew up. And then you get to a point where you realize like, oh my God, as bad as I thought it was, it's been, there's so many other people that have had it so much worse than me to the point where that's probably why I didn't communicate it a lot as I started to get older because I started to recognize that and go like, oh my God, like I almost feel ashamed to talk mm -hmm. about my childhood like it was rough. Like how dare, how dare I say that when there's people that have had it way worse than I do. And I think having that perspective really helps you to reframing that experience. And that has now allowed me to reframe it and have more of a positive attitude of like, okay, now looking at, okay, what did I get from all those things? And now being grateful for that. I don't know if I've been able to reframe that had I not seen a greater perspective. I think volunteering your time is a way to like uh, hijack or get to there faster, right? Like you get, if you force yourself, I think I think about my son raising him, like when he gets to the age, like doing some sort of a mission or volunteering mm -hmm. his time, I think is a quick way versus waiting until he experiences it himself somewhere naturally in life. It's like volunteering his time. It's going to force him in those situations to where he will have to see that. And it's, it's also one of the, one of the ways in life that you can experience the feeling of joy and, and joy was explained to me not that long ago as a feeling that you can have while also simultaneously feeling tired, exhausted, hurt, sick. Joy is this, this feeling that you have. It's like you're out there, you're building houses for people that need help. You're exhausted, you're tired, you're dead, but you feel joyful because mm -hmm. you're doing it uh, for other people. I've been in situations where I've helped, uh, you know, family, friends, who were sick and it was after work and I'm tired and I'm doing these things. But the feeling I had inside would be described uh, as joy. And that's one of the best feelings you could ever um, experience. Not to mention, it's a good thing for other people, right? Yeah. It's a good thing for humanity uh, yeah. to do this kind of thing. Uh, next up, um, to live well below um, your means. It's we, our needs, quote unquote needs or wants, boy, they keep growing every hmm. single year, right? It's like, no, I have to have, internet. No, I have to have 
all these streaming services. Now I have to have all these different things. And it's really interesting when you, when you really start to try to live well below your means, um, how liberating it is. Because I think the other way is to constantly chase something that you're not going to get from getting more things. And the only way to test that is to live well below your means. And this is a skill. This yeah. is why you see people oftentimes <clears throat> with money problems that could be solved by simply starting here and then, you know, it's having very this very countercultural. Place. Yeah. It's, it's very much not uh, promoted enough because we're, we're built off of uh, commodities and buying things and, um, you know, being the next shiny thing. Like we're all, uh, sort of drawn to that, but, um, in terms of healthy practices and making sure that, um, you know, your basic needs are net. Did I say that basic needs are net? <laughs> <laughs> basic needs are met. I mean, that's really the, uh, the main consideration. Everything else from there is like, um, you know, like obviously you can justify things, but to have like healthy parameters in place. So you're, you're, you're definitely making enough to, to keep things sustainable is where you need to stay. Well, I, I was so blown away um, the first time that I read uh, The Millionaire Next Door. And the, one of the biggest takeaways that I got from that book was when they, and they, this, at the time, it was like one of the largest studies on all the, uh, the millionaires in, in the United States. And the most common thing was not the amount of money they made. Mm hmm so you have, so even I these, remember you're showing us. And this. Yeah. Like you're talking about like the top five professions teacher was in there, which yeah. I mean, teachers are notoriously That's underpaid. Um, most of them, if not all of them, damn near all of them, unless you're some professor at a, a, like Ivy league school or making less than six figures. Yet these uh, make up a great, the greatest percentage of millionaires or one of the greatest percentage of millionaires in our country. So what does that tell you uh, about that? So even these people that are, uh, you know, chasing all these things that they want and they want all these materialistic things, uh, they would actually find a way to get more of that if they learn this this practice, like this to be fiscally responsible. What so, were the top cars that were owned by so some the, of the wealth billionaires? So they did, they, yeah, in this book, they also did the top 10 uh, cars driven and Toyota, by Honda, Honda, Honda. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was like Toyota, Honda. It was, I mean, none of the ones you, I think Lexus was probably the one nice car that you saw in there, but you didn't see, you know, Rolls Royce and Ferraris and, you know, Lamborghinis and things like that. It wasn't any of that. It I was, remember, I remember seeing this firsthand when I owned uh, my wellness studio and at, towards the end of my career, I got to the point where I had very high high income, high earning or net worth clients. My, my name had gotten out there. So people were like seeking me out and I'm training these people. And I, I'll never forget, like there, there was a significant percentage of them where you couldn't tell, you couldn't tell. They would drive up in a 150,000 mile, you know, Toyota Forerunner, and they'd wear like regular work. And they were just like, what? And, and it was like, now the things that they did do were things that they really valued, but they didn't spend money on things that they clearly found were not important. Well, that's the other thing that you you find out, and this is why I think this is such an important one uh, uh, about living below your means is, and I talked about this a while back, you you uh, were asking me like how I make decisions on purchasing something. And one of the filters or you know that I use is that, is this something that I feel like I need to go tell somebody else about or share or post or do something about that? And if so, then I don't think I'm really doing it for myself. I'm doing it to impress others. Mm -hmm. And so if I if if that's the reason, which is I think why we do a lot of these things, a lot of the things that we buy, we yeah. buy to send a signal to others. Totally. It's not really about fulfillment. Because right? I think there's nothing wrong with having cool cars and nice things. I'm, I'm not a, a, at all against that stuff. I love that stuff. But you have to ask yourself, do you love it because you get fulfillment and joy from it, or do you love it because it's a signal to everybody else? And the truth is, unfortunately, most of us are signaling to other people of like how much we've made it. Or are you looking for a feeling that you'll never get from something yeah. that you buy? And on top of that, when you're constantly chasing that and you're playing that game, it's you're constantly stressed. You're always behind. You're always in debt. You're always yeah. trying to play catch up versus learning to live well below your means. And then you have this, you learn to build passive income. And then you have this place where it's like, oh, okay, now I have disposable income. Now I can go make those decisions. Now, do I still want those things? More often than not, you don't. But even if you do, yeah. it's not a big deal anymore because you've been disciplined for so long 
that you've been able to set yourself up to where you don't you're not stressing about it. when you look at most people where they say the I forget what the percentage is over seventy five percent I believe is the number that don't even have a thousand dollars in their savings account mm-hmm. uh, more than more than half the our our country. Don't even have a thousand, but yet more than half the country is driving all kinds of nice cars. You yeah, know, the average yeah. person Finance. has a $700 car payment, yeah. but yet doesn't have a thousand dollars in the bank. Basic it's just, responsibility. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and the amount of stress that that causes yeah. and, and who you're really doing it for. So having fiscal responsibility, living well below your means, I think it's such an important part to uh, the, the total health sphere. Totally. And then lastly, now this is a big one because the data and history uh, shows that this is massively impactful. But let's just talk about the data for a second. So this last one is to follow a spiritual practice, meaning actually practice the spiritual practice. There's a difference between we look at the data on people who claim to you know follow this uh, practice or be this religion and people who actually on a weekly basis attend a service or read their scripture or actually practice it. And what you find with people who are actively spiritual is that they're significantly healthier. They report to be significantly happier. They're less depressed, less anxious. They stay married longer. They're less likely to go to jail. And then my favorite ones, they're more likely to volunteer their time, give to charity, and help others. Yeah. And that's, that is strongly connected. This again, this is it very kind of checks off all our previous this, boxes. Now here's the other part of it. And this was part of my journey with this. And I'm not going to get into my own personal, but this, this, this part was my journey. This is uh, something that humans have found incredibly valuable for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And it's very arrogant for people now to be like, well, they were dumb. All those billions of people over the last 2,000, 3,000 years, whatever, were, were, were these, were, you know, our records show that spiritual practices have been around for a long time. They're all dumb because now we know things and we don't need that. But uh, no, this, this, what spiritual practices provide you with is a strong sense of purpose and meaning outside of yeah. the material built world. in community. And yes, here's the deal. If you want to meet other growth minded people, a great way to do that is to follow a spiritual practice with people who are also dedicated to the spiritual practice. These are all people who tend to be growth minded and who look at things uh, uh, a little bit differently. Would you say too, that it, it, it builds um, a level of selflessness too? I feel like it, yeah. it, there, there's something greater than yourself. Like, it, and I think that's such an important. Like, you think about all the other things You're not that we at the talk, top of the hierarchy. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, I think when um, when you have yourself at the the top of the hierarchy, and it's all about me, 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 me. I think uh, even if somehow you you gain all the power or all the money or all the fame and stuff like that, you eventually find out that it's not what. It's, it's not fulfilling. Mm-hmm. It's not worth it. And so people that figure that out sooner and put something above themselves, something chasing something that they can, they'll never reach or they'll never get, you'll, it forever builds that, that purpose and selflessness. Well, the myth is the, 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 the lie, I would say, or the, the belief that people have that's not true is that if you don't do that, right, if you don't follow a spiritual practice, then that means I don't follow a spiritual practice. Oh, no, you do. You do. You're just doing it without... Uh, being conscious. You are worshiping the thing that you value most in the world. It's usually money. It's usually either power or fame, honor, maybe it's pleasure, but whatever is your top value, you end up is becomes your spiritual practice and your purchases, your behaviors, the relationships all point to that thing. Um, So in one way or another, you are going to follow a spiritual practice. But what we're saying here is like intentionally, do it intentionally find your spiritual practice, your religion, meet with people and follow it. And again, the data shows very clearly it has a tremendously profound impact, positive impact on your, on your health. And I'll make the argument now that all the things that we just said here, if somebody were to disconnect from media uh, in a structured way, if they were to structure and eat dinner with their family on a regular basis, if they seeked out coaching and therapy, if they spent a lot of time outdoors, if they volunteered their time on a regular basis, if they tried to live below their means or have the attitude around that and they followed a spiritual practice, I'll make the argument that they're extremely likely to also probably exercise and they probably also yeah. eat in a way that nourishes For their sure. body. 100% agree. Look, if you love Mind Pump, you have to check out our free fitness guides. In fact, we have a fat loss guide on there. It's totally free. It's at mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. I'm on Instagram at Mind Pump DeStefano. And Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. 